Hello everyone. Thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for today's webinar on the VA Caregiver Support Program presented by Sean Tamlin. This webinar is open to caregivers and professionals. CEUs are available through the Board of Behavioral Sciences. In order to obtain your continuing education credit, please email aduguy at caregiver.org with your name and license number or other ID number. I am AJ Dugai, the Education Coordinator for Family Caregiver Alliance. Let me give you a little background on our organization. For over 35 years, we have been working through the Bay Area and across the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers that are providing long-term care. We offer support through educational classes, workshops, fact sheets, retreats, caregiver support services, research, caregiver advocacy, and more. For more information, please visit our website at www.caregiver.org. For the duration of the presentation, your phones will be muted. If you have any questions, you may ask them throughout by going to the GoToMeeting question box on your screen. These questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. After the completion of this webinar, you will be sent an email with a survey. Your feedback is very important to us in shaping our future educational programs, so we would like to thank you in advance for filling those out. Today's speaker is Sean Tamlin. Sean is the Caregiver Support Program Lead for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs Sierra Pacific Integrated Service Network. He is also the Program Lead for the VA Northern California Healthcare System. He currently serves as the chair of the VA National Caregiver Program Training Work Group and chair of the VA Northern California Caregiver Support Council. Mr. Tamlin is, licensed, is a li licensed clinical social worker in the state of California. He received his master's degree from California State University, Sacramento. Without further ado, I'll now turn things over to Sean Tamlin. Thank you, uh, AJ, for inviting me to uh, present at this conference and uh, thank all of you. I thank all of you for joining us today um, as we talk about the VA Caregiver Support Program and, and some of the resources that uh, are offered through the VA for uh, family members and uh, friends and neighbors of veterans that are providing support for those veterans. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say how much I love working for the VA. Um, it is such a, a great and wonderful organization to work for. Uh, a number of years ago when I started with the VA, uh, I started with a little bit of trepidation, not really having a whole lot of information. And, and I certainly had in mind uh, uh, an idea of what it might be uh, to, to work for a federal agency. Um, and when I, I, I came through the doors of the VA hospital and I, I saw the smiles on the faces of the patients and the smiles on the faces of the staff, um, it, it, it really uh, helped me better understand just how much the people at the VA really support the, the mission that we have in, in terms of honoring and supporting our veterans and uh, how much the patients really like it too. Now, that being said, does, does everyone have a great VA experience? Not necessarily. And, and are there problems with the system? And is the system difficult to navigate um, at times? Um, absolutely. Um, and so uh, what I'm hoping today is that as we talk a little bit about the VA and, and talk with each other about some of these programs, we can all come to a better understanding of how to better navigate the VA system and, and the resources that might uh, be in place in order to provide that level of support. So one of the first things that I like to do when I, I, I sit down and I talk with family members um, and with veterans about the VA and even with community service providers is, is I like to, to start out with talking and, and showing a flow chart of the VA and the way that the VA operates because I think um, even here um, there's quite a bit of confusion when it comes to uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs. So um, the, the VA, the Department of Veteran Affairs, is a cabinet-level position. The, the secretary of the VA is a cabinet-level position at the, at the, on the president's cabinet. Um, and many of us, um, especially in, in military circles, are familiar with um, the military being under the Department of Defense. And so just like there's a secretary of, of defense and there's 
different branches like the uh, Department of the Army, the Department of the Navy, so on and so forth, um, the VA also has a secretary that's on the president's cabinet, and the VA also has different branches. And, and one of the things that makes it so confusing for people trying to navigate the VA is that many of these branches refer to themselves as the VA. Um, and so when you talk to a veteran that has concerns about their, uh, their GI Bill, or you talk with somebody who has concerns about their health care, um, sometimes it can be difficult to figure out which branch helps with, with which um, kinds of things. So one of the first things I wanted to, 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 to look at was uh, some of these different branches. Um, the Veterans Health Care Administration, the VHA, um, is the branch of the VA that primarily deals with veterans health care issues. Um, that's the branch of the VA that I work for. So when you think of, of, of VA hospitals, the VA hospitals are going to fall under the branch of the Veterans Health Care Administration. Now, there many people have questions about benefits, um, monetary support for uh, veterans with, with in-home support, in-home care, those kinds of things. Um, and the Veterans Benefits Administration, the VBA, is the branch of the VA uh, that provides support in that area. So when you think of the financial compensation that uh, or pensions that uh, veterans or survivors, uh, widows of veterans may be eligible for, it's typically the Veterans Benefits Administration that would, uh, would, would provide support in that area. Um, and then there's other branches of the VA. The Veterans Cemetery Administration, VCA, does exactly what it sounds like it, it does. They work with the, the federal cemeteries, the, the veteran cemeteries, and burial rights that veterans have. Um, and uh, there's other uh, branches like the, uh, the, the community uh, vet centers that offer outpatient mental health counseling and support for veterans and their families. Um, so, you know, all of these can be very confusing um, and very difficult for uh, veterans and their family members to navigate. Um, and, and it's been a real challenge for people when they're trying to figure out how to uh, meet their needs when it comes to utilizing um, this system. And so as we talk a little bit further, uh, we'll talk more about what the VA has done to help uh, people better navigate this system and navigate this process. So um, one of the things that I, uh, we talked about the different branches, and I mentioned that I, I work for the Veterans Healthcare Administration. The, um, the, the VHA uh, is broken up um, into various uh, integrated service networks. Um, so I happen to work in um, the Veterans Service, uh, Integrated Service Network 21, uh, which covers uh, the shaded areas that you can see on your screen. So there's about one and a half million veterans that live in, in this um, area. Uh, most of uh, California, Nevada, um, uh, the Philippines, Guam, Northern Marinara Islands, and um, the Pacific uh, Islands Healthcare System in Hawaii. Um, so there are uh, a number of, uh, of actual hospitals. There's a number of outpatient clinics uh, within this catchment area um, that the VA uses to provide um, support for our veterans. Now, um, I'm also the, the, uh, a caregiver support coordinator for the VA Northern California Healthcare System, which is the shaded area um, uh, in, shaded in purple on your screen, which uh, encompasses about 350,000 uh, veterans that live in that catchment area. Um, and so the star on the screen near Sacramento uh, shows where the major medical center is. And then you can see those blue dots on the screen representing various outpatient clinics that are available for uh, uh, patients uh, to, to utilize. Um, and there's a uh, way up near the Oregon border, there's a little purple square that indicates one of our storefront um, uh, outpatient, uh, where it's not really a standalone clinic, but it's a, uh, an outreach clinic where we can connect with, with veterans and offer outpatient services at that clinic as well. Um, Sometimes veterans have questions. Maybe a veteran lives in, in Auburn, um, which is uh, in California. But if you look at the map, it's, it's right next to Reno, uh, which is uh, in Nevada. And um, you know, it, it's easier for people to drive from Auburn to Sacramento than it is to, to drive up the mountain passes to get to Reno, which at some parts of the year are covered in snow. 
Um, so uh, sometimes veterans think, well, I live in a certain catchment area, so I have to utilize the, the hospital in that catchment area. But it's simply not, not the case. Um, these boundaries are really designed um, to facilitate uh, the management of the VA clinics and the VA hospitals. And, and boundaries can change, but veterans don't have to necessarily abide by those boundaries. So if they're more comfortable living in one area and utilizing a, a clinic in another area, they're certainly welcome to do that. Um, one of the other uh, issues is that you know, sometimes there may be certain services or certain supports that are only available in the Bay Area, and they're not available in some of the, the outlying rural areas. And so the VA has a, a, a transportation network uh, of vans and, and of um, uh, uh, bus shuttles that uh, can transport people various medical uh, facilities within the, the system of care so they, that they can receive the, the care and support uh, that they're entitled to. So um, my focus is, is uh, working with family caregivers of veterans. And when we think about family caregivers, I think it's really important that we put into perspective some of the challenges that these individuals have. So, if we were to develop a help wanted uh, advertisement for a family caregiver, we might say wanted, untrained family member or friend to act as an advocate, researcher, care manager, and emotional support for a parent or spouse, sibling or friend who has been diagnosed with a serious illness or has a chronic disability. Duties, make medical decisions, negotiate with his companies or Medicare, pay bills, legal work, personal care and entertainment in hospital and rehab, aftercare at home, substitute for skilled nurse if uh, injections, IV oxygen, wound care or tube feedings are required, long-term care, medication management, showering, toileting, lifting, transportation, etc. The hours on demand and the salary and employee benefits none. Now, I know that some of us, if we were looking at that job description, we might look at that and think, well, no way would I apply for a job like that. You know, hours on demand, working 24-7, no break, no vacation, no pay, um, you know, and yet there are our friends, neighbors, family members um, throughout the country um, that day in and day out are toiling and offering that kind of support for their loved ones so that their loved ones can stay at home uh, and, and benefit from health in the home as long as possible. One of the other issues that we often uh, look at when we're dealing with, with um, family caregivers is how invisible they can sometimes feel. Uh, you know, especially I've noticed in the VA, you know, the tendency tends to be a focus on the veteran, and our mission tends to be a mission of providing support for the veteran. And, and sometimes the caregiver can feel as if they're, they're, they're lost in the haze of, of uh, you know, the support that, that's, that's being provided. Uh, Deb Cosner wrote this um, poem that I thought very eloquently illustrated, uh, you know, some of the concerns that she had. Uh, she talks about how many people, so many people ask about her loved one, and they want to know how he's doing and what he's remembering and what he's forgiving, if he's enjoying life. And she asks, sometimes I wonder what's wrong with them. Why doesn't anyone at least once in a while ask about me? I'm standing right in front of them. Why can't they see that my life too has changed, that my pain and frustration are real? I am real. Why can't they acknowledge my loss and acknowledge me? The family caregiver is such an important part of the, uh, the, the patient treatment team when it comes to providing support um, for um, the, our, our patients. Um, if it wasn't for the family caregiver, um, we, uh, the, the patients and, and the people that we take care of, the, our loved ones, uh, may be at risk of institutionalized, uh, being put into institutionalized settings rather than um, staying at home. Um, and so family caregivers really provide a, a benefit um, to their loved ones and, and a benefit to the medical community. Um, it would be much more expensive to house a veteran in a, a contract nursing home or to provide a professional home health aid to be in the home uh, you know, the number of hours that family caregivers are 
to provide that level of support. It would be cost prohibitive. Um, and so the support that, that family caregivers provide is truly remarkable and should be appreciated. And we should work towards helping family caregivers be an integral part of the treatment team and not feel so left out. So in, uh, in 2010, Congress passed a law called the Caregiver Veteran Omnibus Service Act. And the purpose of this law was to do exactly what I talked about, to, to really put caregivers um, in the forefront of uh, the services and support uh, that the VA is, is providing support to. Um, this law was passed unanimously by both houses of Congress um, in April of 2010. Um, in May of 2010, President Obama signs, um, uh, signed it into law. And, um, and, and in May of 2011, uh, the VA uh, uh, geared up in terms of fully implementing the, uh, the, the, the various portions of this law. So Congress really wanted the VA to provide additional support. And I'll be talking about some of these um, uh, areas on this list as it indicates to the support that Congress wanted um, the, the, the VA to provide as part of this law. So one of the first things that the VA did um, early on was they provided a caregiver support helpline um, and a website for family caregivers of veterans so that they can get information. The helpline uh, is staffed by clinical professionals. Um, these professionals are, are housed at Canandaigua, uh, New York. They're, they're housed in the same facility that houses the Veterans Crisis Line um, for veterans that are in crisis or, or feel uh, suicidal. Um, and so these clinicians are, are available uh, you know, during the day and even in the evening, uh, the line is covered by the Veterans Crisis Line counselors. So these are professionals that family caregivers can call uh, any time, day or night, if they need somebody to talk to. Um, it, it isn't necessarily a crisis line, it's a helpline. So really the, um, what, what the, the counselors at that line will be able to do is to provide general navigational support for family caregivers re related to resource, um, active empathetic listening if that's what's needed. Um, and uh, they, they also provide some uh, additional services in the way of workshops, or uh, they can even arrange after hours uh, telephone counseling for people that aren't able to get um, support through traditional uh, VA uh, services. So it's, it's a very uh, well-utilized um, program that they offer. They, um, they also instituted a website where um, family caregivers can go to find out what's new about the program, um, to read inspirational stories. Uh, they have a toolbox that um, assists family caregivers with different tools um, like medication logs or uh, different uh, information regarding self-care uh, that can be of value for family members that are providing support. Uh, one of the benefits of, of, um, of this uh, website is that it can also help people locate uh, who their local family caregiver support coordinators are. The VA uh, put um, uh, one of the, the consequences of the law passed in 2010 was that um, the VA uh, put caregiver support coordinators like myself at each of the VA medical centers um, throughout the United States. And these uh, caregiver support coordinators are clinical experts on caregiver issues um, including both VA and non-VA resources. Um, they organize caregiver-focused activities and services, and they also ensure that caregiver sensitivity is integrated into all the programs throughout the VA. So one of the things that the helpline will do is um, in situations where family members or veterans require uh, additional, more localized help with resources or support, uh, they will refer uh, those family members electronically to the local caregiver support coordinators that can be um, of uh, help and support and, and can provide more localized direction uh, for people that uh, really need that additional help with, with navigation or resource information. Um, 
on the website itself, for, for professionals, this may be helpful for you to know. It's hard to see on the screen capture, um, but if you, you look at the screen capture, you look at the, the, the bottom right-hand corner in purple, it, it says, find your local caregiver support coordinator. There is a, a zip code locator uh, in, in a box there where you can put in your zip code, and that will give you the phone number of the local caregiver support coordinators in your area. Um, and so they can be a resource for local professional community providers as well. If you're having difficulty making connection with the VA, or if you're looking for information on resources that a veteran may or may not be eligible for. Um, and so it can be, uh, this can also be a resource for uh, professional clinicians that uh, need to get that information as it might relate to uh, uh, helping their uh, patient develop a treatment plan um, related to whatever issues they might be dealing with. So um, in the VA, um, the care caregivers of eligible veterans of all eras may qualify for a menu of different services. And um, when, when uh, we look at that, we, we put may, um, and I, it, we should put a big asterisk next to that because uh, there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts about what people may qualify for or what they don't. Um, and uh, it's difficult for uh, anyone outside of the VA system to really, you know, be an expert on you know, what you, what you do qualify for, what you don't. And, uh, you know, sometimes services are only available as the budget allows, and so uh, they're, it, it's constantly changing in terms of what services are available. And, you know, some, some services are available at certain medical centers and not at others. And so uh, one of the values of having a local caregiver support coordinator is that they can help uh, people facilitate an understanding of these different services and, and what might be available. So I thought I would talk a little bit about some of these services in a little bit more detail, um, just so that you have an understanding of, of how these services work. Um, I, would, uh, I, I would let people know that, generally speaking, um, the VA as a healthcare system it is primarily geared towards providing support for those veterans that suffered uh, injury or illness um, while they were uh, on active duty. Um, for uh, and providing support for uh, the family members of uh, of those that we've lost um, on active duty. So primarily, there, the, if if a veteran was injured or they suffered an illness on on active duty, the VA is there to provide support for those veterans. The the second category of veterans are those that were veterans that can't afford to pay for medical services, and so the VA has been a safety net for people that have. Uh, lost their jobs or their low income or uh, they have housing issues and they're homeless um, that, to, to provide support for those veterans. Um, all other veterans, um, their eligibility for services might depend on their uh, ability to pay for those services or might depend upon how injured or uh, uh, how ill they were while they were on active duty and, 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 and what that relates to now. Um, so. Looking through some of these different menus of services that veterans may be eligible for, uh, one of the areas that's, um, that, that's offered to uh, certain eligible veterans is, is skilled nursing. Um, if a veteran was um, injured uh, and uh, in need of skilled nursing uh, in the home or at a skilled nursing facility, uh, that is something that um, the, the VA would um, provide support for. Um, so skilled nursing is certainly one example of of uh, something that can be helpful for a veteran. Now, you may look at that and think, well, wait a minute, that's for the veteran. Well, what about the caregiver? Well, sometimes caregivers aren't aware of, of these services, and so they're not even aware that they can ask for skilled nursing support. And so by the VA providing skilled nursing support, um, that can give the caregiver a break. Um, it can uh, provide them a, 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 a semblance of, of, of respite. Um, as it relates to doing the hands-on skilled nursing uh, when you may have a VA provider that can be paid um, for to provide that, that service. Uh, another service that's available um, to veterans that is helpful for uh, family caregivers to know about is uh, home health aides. Um, and so for those of you that are unaware of what a home health aide is, uh, a home health aide is, is, a, is a professional uh, that the VA will, um, can pay for 
to come into the home a, a few hours a week and provide unskilled um, care for um, a, a veteran that has difficulty with activities of daily living. Um, it may be their ability to feed themselves, groom themselves, bathe themselves, um, or a variety of other uh, uh, incidental activities of daily living uh, related to their age. Um, the VA generally provides home health aids to veterans that have a service-connected uh, need for home health aids. Um, the VA will, will uh, also, in some cases, provide home health aid respite to family caregivers where uh, they may have a number of hours that the VA pays for a home health aid, um, but it's for a, a temporary period of time. Oftentimes, family caregivers are working 24-7 and uh, you know they just don't get a break. Um, even running to the grocery store can be a major ordeal uh, if they're dealing with uh, somebody that has significant uh, medical or uh, mental health challenges. And so having a home health aide in the home, even for a few hours um, a week, uh, can be a, a major relief. I've, I've talked to family caregivers that were, were crying with joy just because they could go out for a couple hours and get their hair done and not have to worry of, that the veteran was home by himself and what might happen to him for those couple of hours that they were away. Or, um, you know, they're able to go to the grocery store or the post office and run errands uh, without uh, um, needing to, to, to drag their, their veteran behind them while they do that. And uh, they, they, or just go to yoga or uh, in, in, uh, participate in self-care uh, caregiver uh, uh, support groups that they might not otherwise um, have time or the ability to participate in. And so that's been of, of great benefit to uh, those individuals that are able to take advantage of that resource. Uh, Home-based primary care uh, is another um, resource that can be very helpful for uh, the veterans and their family caregivers. Uh, Home-based primary care is where the VA provides uh, uh, doctors, social workers, nurses, uh, recreation therapists, uh, occupation therapists in the home rather than asking the veteran to uh, come out to a, a medical city, uh, facility to, to receive those services. So that can be very beneficial for an individual that has difficulty leaving the home. Um, there are some folks that are bed bound and to travel to the medical center basically means hiring uh, a medical transport company like a, a private ambulance service to drive them to the hospital. It's, it can be very expensive. And um, so as a result, home-based primary care pro can provide that general medical support in the home uh, you know, rather than in a hospital setting. And so uh, that's uh, been extremely valuable for uh, family members of, of, of veterans that are working with them to provide that, that support in the home. Medical equipment um, is, is offered, uh, durable medical equipment, shower chairs, grab bars, um, in some cases, um, you know, elevators uh, needed to, uh, you know, assist people getting up and down stairs. Um, so when you're talking about medical equipment, sometimes home modification is involved. Um, there's certain grants available um, to, uh, to veterans that meet certain requirements as it relates to medical equipment, home modification, and vehicle modification. Um, those are all uh, you know, different areas where people can get support with. So if somebody's elderly, uh, they've declined to the point where they're in a wheelchair, and, and that's likely going to be their situation uh, for their future, um, perhaps a, a one-time home modification uh, would be in order where you know, doors could be widened, wheelchair ramps could be built. Um, they could provide accommodations regarding a, a wheelchair lift on a vehicle or something of that nature um, to provide that support um, for that veteran that, that's dealing with those uh, particular issues. Um, so um, if people aren't aware of these services, they're often trying to engage in, in, in uh, resolving these issues on their own, um, and yet there are some, some VA resources that are available to uh, assist with some of those things. Aid in attendance is uh, a special uh, pension or special compensation uh, program for uh, homebound veterans. Um, it, it, it's special 
money that, that may be in addition to a pension or compensation that they're already receiving that can help offset some of the out-of-pocket costs associated with in-home care. Um, there are, like anything else, there's a number of, of factors about who qualifies and, and how they qualify. Um, there uh, is uh, some income restrictions or um, asset restrictions. If you, you, you have too many assets, you may not qualify. Um, but there's a variety of vet veterans that do fall into the category of being able to apply for aid and attendance. And it's a, um, a, a, a great benefit uh, to them as it helps pay some of the out-of-pocket costs associated with hiring a home health aid or using a, uh, a boarding care facility. Um, and so that's been a great and wonderful resource. Now, the aid and attendance program, as I mentioned earlier, it's a monetary program. So it actually doesn't uh, fall into the auspices of the Veterans Health Care Administration. So, you know, sometimes people are going to their doctor saying, well, I need aid and attendance. How do I get it? They're confused um, because they're not getting what they want. And, and the aid and attendance program is actually run through the, um, the Veterans Benefits Administration. Now, for those of you on the call that uh, you're curious, you know, what the best way might be to uh, assist someone apply for aid and attendance, um, I, I would give you this piece of advice. Um, the, the, the VA will, will tell people that they can apply on their own. Um, and there's a, an application that people can fill out. They can get it online. And then they could submit it directly to the, the Veterans Benefits Administration to apply for aid and attendance. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of, of how technical and how difficult application can be, many people do not submit a complete application or they don't fully uh, complete the paperwork. And so that results in significant delays in terms of the uh, approval of their application for that program. So I would recommend that people who are interested in applying for aid and attendance uh, make sure that they use a, a professional that can help them fill out that paperwork. It shouldn't cost them any money um, to use um, a, a professional. Nobody should charge um, for helping people fill out federal government paperwork. Um, so that, that shouldn't be an issue. But there's a variety of people in the community that can help do that. Um, in California, I refer people to the county veteran service officers, uh, generally speaking. Um, I find that the county veteran service officers uh, they actually work for the, the California State Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, they're uh, very well trained. They're, they're up on the latest uh, 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 news and latest information related to claims um, day in and day out. People in their communities processing these claims. They're, they're often uh, uh, retired veterans themselves. Um, and so um, I found, by and large, uh, those organizations are, are extremely helpful when it comes to uh, helping people you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's when it comes to an aid and, an aid and attendance application. Um, so uh, that's definitely a resource to uh, keep in mind uh, when you're looking at uh, how to, how to give, give that support to your patients that are looking for aid and attendance. Um, uh, many other states also offer, have county veteran service officers. So if you're living outside the state of California, it's worth looking into to, to build a relationship with some of those folks. <laughs> there's also people, um, there's a, a numerous people that are certified to help with claims. There's people that work for uh, VFW, AMVET, DAV. Um, there's a lot of different acronyms uh, thrown out there related to veteran service organizations. Um, there, there's wonderful people in all of those organizations that are very knowledgeable uh, that can assist as well. Um, I've just found the most success with the, with the county uh, folks. Um, in addition to aid and attendance, one of the other benefits that um, is uh, very helpful for uh, family caregivers of, of veterans is, is respite. And respite is something that a lot of folks aren't aware that they're uh, eligible for. And so when we talk about respite, what we're talking about is we're talking about a substitute or a break for the caregiver. Now. I, I mentioned uh, home health aid uh, that can be available for uh, the Karens. Um, there's also a community living center respite. And so a community living center would be a safe place where the veteran could stay. 
uh, for up to 30 days per calendar year. If the caregiver needed to travel, or maybe the caregiver is, uh, they're going to have an operation themselves and they're going to have some time that they need to recuperate before they can take care of the veteran again. Um, so it's a safe place for veterans to stay that really require that 24-7 uh, uh, comprehensive um, support. Uh, there's other forms of respite. Adult day health um, is a form of respite where uh, the veteran's picked up. He goes to a senior center type of uh, facility during the day. Um, uh, people uh, play games, they socialize, they read the paper, they uh, eat healthy meals, um, uh, engage in recreational uh, activities, um, and it gets them out of the house. Um, so it's very helpful for people that are at risk of being homebound. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's helpful for the family caregiver because you get the, the, the veteran out of the house a couple of days a week, and so it frees up their time to you know, focus on other other tasks, other other chores, other responsibilities, or again, just having a breather uh, for themselves. Um, there's uh, sometimes contract nursing homes can be utilized for respite. Um, the availability of these different forms of respite uh, really depend upon the medical center um, in your catchment area. Um, so, utilizing the caregiver support coordinators in your area, uh, you can better understand what forms of respite may or may not be um, available. There are uh, support groups, uh, education and training um, that is available for uh, the family caregivers of our veterans. Uh, some of the uh, support groups we offer uh, may be non-traditional in terms of the way that we provide support groups. There are traditional support groups where uh, you meet at an outpatient clinic or at a medical center, but some of the non-traditional support groups might be, for example, the Building Better Caregiver Program. So. The Building Better Caregiver Program is a program that was uh, uh, piloted through Stanford University and found to be very effective when it came to providing support for uh, the family caregivers of, of veterans. Uh, that program was rolled out nationally by the National Caregiver Support Program, and it's been helpful uh, in terms of uh, a, a non-traditional approach to, to providing support for family caregivers. Um, this is an online program, and so family caregivers can log into the program online whenever they have availability. It may be 12 o'clock uh, a.m., it may be, you know, 5 in the morning. Um, it's whenever they have time to log on, they can participate in the, the, uh, a psychoeducational uh, component of uh, that uh, 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 support group, and there's also an online bulletin board that people can use to uh, support each other and to, to gather information and resources. Um, so so uh, that's been helpful. Um, the VA offers uh, a regular um, telephone uh, workshops. Um, and these telephone workshops um, they'll offer throughout the summer. They're offering three different they're offering the same workshop, you know, three different times per month um, to give the caregiver some options on when they might want to phone in. Uh, to that uh, uh, to that workshop, and so that's been very helpful because uh, oftentimes family caregivers, you know, they need to find somebody to sit with their their veteran, or they need to find a respite, or uh, you know, hire somebody to be there with their veteran while they engage in traditional groups. And so this is a way where they can still be at home, um, and uh, perhaps when uh, their loved one is napping or otherwise uh, engaged or uh, you know, and, and, and participate in some of these um, support groups and some of this education and some of the training. Now, so far I've been talking about um, the uh, services and support that are generally available to um, all veterans. And so if you look at this new slide I just put up on the screen, um, there are current benefits that are available to all eras of veterans, and we talked a little bit about that. And then the law that we talked about earlier, um, the Caregiver Veteran Omnibus Service Act, they also added some additional benefits for certain eligible post-9-11 era veterans. Um, the, the, these young, you know, 20-something-year-old veterans with 20-something-year-old spouses and, or girlfriends, you know, they have very unique uh, challenges when it comes to uh, family caregiving and support. Um, and as a result of that, 
uh, Congress um, offers a, a very uh, unique and very specific um, support that they may be eligible for. So in addition to all the other services that are offered, if a veteran has, uh, if they have a service-connected injury or a service-connected mental health issue that requires a need for a family caregiver, the family caregiver may be eligible for uh, a monthly stipend based upon the, the, the need for support. Uh, they may be eligible for health care coverage uh, through CHAMP VA if they don't already have um, health care coverage. Uh, they may also be eligible for mental health services, and uh, that would be provided by a VA provider or a provider that the VA would contract with to provide that support. Um, they may also be eligible for travel, lodging, and per diem um, for uh, providing uh, support for the veteran related to uh, VA appointments or related to required training as part of the program. Um, so, you know, in some cases, as we looked at that map early on, uh, you know, we ha may have a veteran that lives hours away from a major medical center and um, they need a, a major surgery. Um, and they're going to be, uh, you know, several days post-op recovering. Well, for people that are enrolled in this program, the family caregivers can receive lodging and, and uh, per diem, which is kind of like a miscellaneous um, expense uh, reimbursement um, related to those kinds of uh, appointments. Um, so there's some great benefits that um, are available to um, uh, those eligible post-9-11 era caregivers and veterans uh, when it comes to uh, that uh, that level of, of, of support. So I put my contact information in the slide for those of you that uh, may want to uh, get a hold of me directly. Uh, you may have specific questions that uh, you don't feel comfortable uh, asking uh, in a presentation of this nature, and I understand that. So uh, there's my phone number, uh, there's my email. Um, I, just to let you know, I'm, I'm usually much more accessible via email that I am phone, so you probably would want to try email first, and then if we need to talk over the phone, uh, we can figure out a, a time uh, to, to do a phone conference to talk about your specific issues. Um, as a regional coordinator of the program, um, I, I've worked with a number of the other regional uh, folks across the country, uh, so if you don't happen to be from California or my catchment area, um, I can help guide you in the right direction if you need uh, support uh, on a much more local basis. I'm, I'm happy to do that. So um, at this point, uh, I'd like to go ahead and conclude my remarks. Um, I'm interested in, uh, in hearing some of the questions that uh, you and the audience may have, and um, I'm happy to uh, open things up to, to questions at this time. Okay, thank you, Sean. That was some very helpful information, and we thank you for taking your time to share that with us. We actually did get quite a few questions, so I will go through as many as we have time for. The first one is, does a, does a non-medical caregiving agency need to be accredited slash authorized by the VA before they can provide service? If yes, what's the process of accreditation? You know, that, that's an excellent question, um, and, and one of the things that I think is important for us to understand is that um, as much as some, of, uh, some people would <laughs> like to believe that the, the VA is, is a, um, a one-stop shop, the reality is, is that none of us can really do this alone. Um, we all uh, need, um, there, there may be services that uh, service gaps that the VA doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't meet. Um, and so one of the things that I do as a caregiver support coordinator is I work um, with community organizations uh, outside of the VA when the VA organizations don't, um, uh, don't, don't work the way that um, we want them to work. Um, so uh, in regards to your specific question, you know, yes, there are very strict guidelines about which home health agencies the VA uses. Um, uh, there, uh, there, there are specific um, criteria as it relates to uh, becoming a, uh, for uh, uh, becoming a, a service provider. I believe for those of you that are interested, um, there's a place called sam.gov, 
Um, and what you have to do is you, you, you go through SAM.gov um, just to get qualified to start bidding on uh, federal contracts. Um, so you would go through SAM.gov, you would get qualified, and then there would be another website that you would go to that you would search for open contracts. So the VA will advertise, we're looking for home health agencies in this area to provide support for veterans. And then there you would go ahead and put a bid in um, for, for, for that uh, contract. So um, that is not an area that's necessarily like my area of expertise, but hopefully uh, that question will, uh, that answer will help point you in the right direction as it relates to um, uh, looking for those contracts. Okay, thank you, Sean. So the next question is asking for you to clarify, is home health aid available to non-service connected vets? Explain what service connected means, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so um, when, uh, when veterans are, are injured or they suffer a, an illness while they're on active duty and they file a claim with the VA for that uh, illness or that injury, um, the VA uh, gives a rating of uh, anywhere from zero to 100 um, percent, depending on how much that injury or that illness incapacitates that particular veteran. Um, so, the uh, uh, so so that's what a service-connected rating is, um, and uh, veterans that have different levels of rating, for example, 50 to 100 percent, um, may uh, pay different fees or, or have fees waived in, in that case than veterans that rate under 50% in terms of their service-connected rating. Um, so when you look at home health aids um, through the VA, uh, the, the, the VA typically only offers regular home health aids to service-connected veterans um, that uh, meet that need. Um, and what you would probably want to do if you had uh, more specific questions is to get in touch with the caregiver support coordinator uh, in your local area so that you could find out exactly what's offered in that area and what the criteria is because it may, it may be different from VA facility to VA facility. Um, in, in, uh, in, in, in the cases of non-service connected veterans, um, uh, the uh, home health aid respite um, is, is, is often an option um, at, at medical centers um, versus like a regular home health aid. And so home health aid respite is, uh, is generally only provided for a, a very brief period of time. Um, and, uh, and, and, and oftentimes people who are non-service connected veterans are paying out of pocket for home health aid services. It's, it's often not provided through the VA unless they have a, a service-connected need for home health aids. So I hope that that answered your question. Thank you, Sean. I'll just move along to the next one because we have quite a few. What determines if a vet is eligible to receive in-home services? Length of tour of duty slash service, type of discharge? Well, um, what, what, what often determines uh, in-home uh, services, are, it, I'm not sure if the question is related to home health aides or to uh, in-home, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the nursing services that are provided in the home. Um, the, uh, the, the nursing services are generally available. Um, they're uh, specifically, uh, the home-based primary care program is specifically, uh, uh, generally is targeting the, the geriatric community. Um, and so it's both non-service connected and service connected veterans that would, would qualify for that program. There, there often is a, a, um, a, a radius uh, mileage uh, requirement. You have to live within a certain distance from a VA medical center or a VA community-based outpatient clinic to qualify for that service. So that's a service that you would really, again, need to refer to your local um, a clinic to the, and caregiver support coordinator to determine if it's available. So, for example, um, in, in Sacramento, um, the, the radius was, you know, 60 miles from the Sacramento Medical Center. And more recently, home, uh, within the last um, three years, actually, home-based primary care has moved to 
uh, other outpatient clinics, uh, Yuba City, Reading Chico, where it wasn't available before. Um, so, um, you know, those clinics are hours away from, from Sacramento. Reading is uh, driving-wise maybe a, a two-and-a-half-hour, three-hour drive um, from Sacramento. Um, so it, 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 those services are becoming more and more available, but often the, the, the criteria is, is more related to how that your distance from the medical center in terms of if, if home-based primary care is provided. In terms of the home health aides, um, it, it's, it's often based upon service connected uh, need. So it, it doesn't link the service, where you serve doesn't matter. If you were uh, stateside, you got in a car accident while you're on active duty, you're 100 uh, percent disabled due to that car accident, you, 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 you may be eligible for a home health aid or skilled nursing or that kind of support. Okay, thank you. The next question is, can vets who receive financial benefits also receive in-home support services, or is it one or the other only? Um, veterans uh, may, be, uh, may, may qualify for both um, is, is the easy answer to your question. So, okay. um, the, the, so it would be a good idea for the veteran to check into that um, based upon their individual circumstances and see um, uh, in, in terms of the, the comprehensive benefits for post-9-11 era veterans, um, that's also the case. So uh, a veteran may be receiving a, a special compensation for aid in attendance um, because they're severely uh, uh, disabled as a result of their, their active duty uh, injury or, or mental health issue. And, and the caregiver may also uh, receive uh, uh, compensation through the caregiver support um, program. We don't do what we call double dipping which means we're not going to pay a, home, a caregiver for something that a home health agency is, is, is doing. Um, but home health agencies often only go so far. Um, so to give you an example, if um, a veteran was uh, catastrophically injured in a, 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 an Air Force veteran who was in a plane accident, and the VA is paying for skilled nursing five days a week, uh, 24 hours a day, but the family is providing support on the weekend for those 48 hours on the weekend, um, you know, the family caregiver may be eligible for um, a, a significant stipend just based upon the kind of support that they need to provide on the weekend when the, the skilled nursing isn't there. Okay, thank you. The next question is, do the home health aid or aid in attendance programs include housekeeping services such as being able to change a bed, do laundry, or vacuum? Uh, uh, typically, they, they don't. Typically, their, their focus is um, providing uh, support for the veteran um, directly. And so um, they will, uh, sometimes they will do light, what they call light housekeeping. Um, and, uh, but they don't, they're not typically, you know, doing the ironing, um, you know, and, and doing other things. But uh, you would want to talk with the home health agency uh, when you're approved about, what they would provide the support with and, uh, and, and, and what they wouldn't. Um, I know some people have gotten angry because they weren't ironing their curtains or something. I, but, but that's not really, you know, their, their main focus is the veteran. And changing a bed if somebody's incontinent or something could, could possibly be part of that. Um, but that would be something that you would um, discuss with the contracted home health agency in terms of what they, they do and what they, they don't. But um, doing the laundry, folding clothes, that kind of stuff's not not typically things that they would be doing. Okay. And how do we get organizations vetted so caregiver hot, the caregiver hotline has it as a resource in their database? Well, I, I think that that's um, a real challenge. I, I think that, the, and, um, you know, the National Caregiver um, Support Line, you know, typically in their database they're using, you know, federal, uh, uh, federal uh, programs. Um, so if you have a national program that works nationally that you think could be beneficial to, to, to veterans nationally, um, why don't you email me um, based upon the, the email contact that I put out there, uh, sean.tamblin at va.gov, and, and I can connect you with Carrie Malcolm, who's the, uh, the head of the, um, uh, the, 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 head of, of the uh, National Caregiver Support Line, and, and we can see what Carrie can do about that. Generally speaking, as a local caregiver support coordinator, 
uh, you know, you, you've seen what my catchment area looks like in terms of, of geography. Um, and for those of you not that familiar with California, it's a long state. So um, Sacramento to the Oregon border is, is quite a large geography um, to, to, to work in and to travel in. Um, and so I, I often rely on community partners in the community to provide um, support for uh, my patients where, where, uh, where the VA can't. And so where you may find um, better bang for your buck is, is to connect with the local caregiver support coordinator um, if you're serving in a specific community and let them know what you do and, and how you may be of service um, so that you can get on their list um, as an organization that would be helpful. Um, so if, if your services are more localized, the National Caregiver Support Line is probably not going to be the best place. It's probably your local medi VA medical center that can, you know, start uh, uh, referring folks out to you. Um, if it's uh, a national program, then um, uh, send me an email and I can get you connected with Carrie Malcolm. Okay, thank you, Sean. The next question is, who would fit a family member call to apply for respite? What is the phone number in California for county veteran service officers? Well, that, that's a great question. So, California, uh, so so the state of California actually has its own um, it, it, it's its own uh, Department of Veteran Affairs, which again becomes confusing because people say that they talk to the VA and they could be talking about the California State Department of Veteran Affairs, which call themselves CalVet. So CalVet has a website um, that you can go to, and it lists the county veteran service officers on their website um, for the various counties. And so that would um, that that would that would help you connect with those county veteran service officers. Um, as as for respite, um, respite is generally a, a, a service that's provided through the the VA primary care provider. So when you talk about veterans' benefits, there are some veterans that may receive compensation from the government for their injuries, but they don't actually use the VA as a health care system. And sometimes it can be helpful for veterans who are eligible to enroll in the VA, even if they're primarily getting their care through TRICARE or through a privatized insurance, because they can utilize the VA for things like respite where if they were utilizing Kaiser or another pri uh, private provider, as an example, they may be paying out of pocket for, for that, that kind of service. So um, for respite, um, the veteran would want to enroll in VA health care, and they would want to, to ask their primary care provider about respite, and the primary care provider would, would generally facilitate uh, referrals for respite. Okay, thank you. And kind of going along with that, another person asked, are all caregivers of veterans eligible for respite, or are there some who are not? Um, respite is, is generally provided to, um, to, to, to veterans of all eras um, that are enrolled in, uh, in the VA. Um, the different forms of respite that may be available um, they differ. Um, uh, they, they can differ depending upon the, the veteran's uh, service-connected need for respite. Um, the the post-9/11 era veterans they uh, that are enrolled in the the comprehensive benefits program, they're they're even offered some uh, expanded forms of respite that that other veterans are not. Um, so generally speaking, respite. If your veteran's enrolled in VA and getting health care through the VA. Uh, there should should be some form of respite available, and you can talk with your local VA facility about uh, and your local caregiver support coordinator about the respite options that might be available. If you're if you're taking care of a veteran, it's very important to um, to to plan ahead for the eventuality of an emergency or something that might happen. Um, it, it it it's very difficult. Um, for people that call the VA and say, well, I'm, you know, 75, I'm taking care of my 80-year-old husband, and he told me when I just couldn't take it anymore, I could call the, the, the VA and the VA would take care of everything and, and, you know, put him in a home and all this. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the, the government doesn't work quickly um, and people are very 
discouraged and very disappointed when they find out that there's a waiting list for specific services they're trying to, to get. Um, and so it's a good idea to, to start early in terms of asking questions and finding out what's available at your local facility. So even though you may not need respite now, in the future you'll know what it is, how to get it, and what the wait time looks like. Okay, thank you, Sean. That's actually all the time we have for questions. Please feel free to email Sean the remaining questions that weren't answered at sean.tamblin at va.gov. Thank you for everyone who participated in today's webinar. If you have any questions for Family Caregiver Alliance, you can reach me at 800 445 8106. And again, you'll receive a survey in your email, and we would really appreciate it if you could fill those out. Thank you to Mr. Tamblin for joining us today. This webinar is now concluded.